body track here today. Chris Frank with TRX in the house. We're obsessed with force, as we should be. That's about output. That's raw wattage and horsepower. We get it. We're really looking at variability and changes in function, sometimes related to, to things that we're not thinking about. And specifically, I don't think we've done a good job in strength conditioning is come up with reference pressures, reference shapes. We're trying to do that better, right? This is a position where the joint has the peak function and the most, the most accessibility to being able to handle a variety of movement skills, right? So that those motor tasks remain open-ended. What's interesting is that even just throwing these different shoes on here, if I compare myself barefoot, that would be my reference position. That's where my body theoretically has the best programming, the best sort of variability or sort of function based on pressure, quads, hamstrings turning on. What happens when I start lifting my heel? What happens when I end up in a squishy shoe? What happens when I'm in, our contention is that the shoe that disrupts the least amount of your indigenous foot mechanic balance and capacity to reclaim that balance position quickly is the best shoe for that task, right? So this is a fine running shoe if I, all it's doing is landing and we could, we, could, we could evaluate that shoe for a running specific. Am I seeing high variability in the landing? Is it taking the athlete a long time? But for a training shoe, this is a disaster. Trying to find a high complex skill on a really squishy surface. So what we're looking at then is, and we should be having this conversation, is how much does the shoe disrupt fundamentally these primary balanced motor patterns because the training is more about now, it's gotta be about skill acquisition, not just work and capacity, right? What would you add to that? I'd add to that, we keep looking at the pressures that are going down into the mat and evaluating on that, but it's also reciprocal, the pressures that are coming back up into the shoe and now if we go back to the assumption or the recognition that all our proprioception comes from our foot, our hands, our face, depending on the feedback we're getting from the ground, either barefoot right to our CNS, or now it has to be muffled through a particular shoe so it's not just output, it's input. So as we're trying to give those intrinsic cues, I want you to feel at this part of your foot. I want you, I love the idea of dissociating the toe. So it really is that, that two-way feedback. We can now get information we haven't had before and now can we feed that back into the athlete so they can now start to auto-regulate? Be an action, right? Yeah. And says the man who's wearing the flattest, oldest, least squishy <laughs> shoe you can buy commercially. Right. <laughs> right? Right? Which is basically the equivalent of being barefoot with style. Right? That's really what it's about. So, how, you know, I think that's what's interesting about this tech is ultimately it's really wow factor. But how does it affect me? Well, I can make maybe different decisions based on my ability to reproduce patterns. If I have one of our athletes try to set up five different times in the shoe, we're going to have five different outcomes. So how can we reduce complexity in a very highly variable motor task? How do we at least begin to simplify systems so that they, we can understand what we're seeing, which is what we're not doing. Foot position, foot torque, foot out. Let's start having a conversation at the uh, at the granular level.